vasculature. It will depend upon its solubility and volume. Uh, the clinical features are, uh, or the clinical sequelae depends upon the solubility and volume. The most common cause among the gases will be the air, which is usually due to iatrogenic complication. There are three different types of embolism, venous, arterial, and paradoxical. Venous is air in the venous circulation, which is occluding or impeding the distal, distal flow. Arterial is air in the arterial circulation. Paradoxical is uh, any air emboli which crosses from the venous to arterial or systemic circulation via a congenital defect, uh, for example, with patent ductus arteriosus. The risk factors in uh, venous air embolism are, uh, we have surgical, anesthetic, and patient factors. Among the surgical factors, sitting craniotomy, uh, posterior fossa surgery, any, any shoulder surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and exteriorization of uterus. Uh, anesthetic factors include the central venous axis, any pressurized uh, infusions, non-primed giving sets, unrecognized epidural vein cannulation. Um, patient factors include any trauma which includes uh, blunt and penetrating trauma or hypo and hypovolemia. Uh, coming to the arterial uh, air embolism risk factors, uh, among the surgical factors include the cardiopulmonary bypass, ECMO, cardiac ablation, intracardiac shunting, and carotid end arterectomy. Anesthetic factors include if there is any error priming the transducer sets. And patient factors includes the uh, uh, any presence of patent foramen OVL, ASD, or VSD. These are the risk factors. And the factors which increases the risk are in, in the, when the surgical site is higher than the right atrium, it increases the risk of air embolism. Uh, or uh, if a vasculature exposure in a surgical field also increases the risk. Um, if there is any pressure difference of at least 5 cm of water, will allow 100 ml of air entrainment per second uh, via a 14 gauge cannula. So this is the reason why we give a head down position during a central vein cannulation. Um, hypovolemia and negative pressure associated with spontaneous breathing, uh, spontaneous respiration can also increase the risk. The clinical features, the clinical features or the sequelae will depend upon the rate and the volume of air entrained. Uh, first coming to the cardiovascular system, tachy and brady arrhythmia may be noted. If the air embolism, air emboli is uh, lodged in the pulmonary vasculature, it increases the pulmonary arterial pressure, which in turn increases the right heart strain. But if the air, air emboli is large enough, which, uh, which, which is larger enough in volume in the right ventricle, it causes right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which leads to a decrease in left ventricular preload and results in cardiovascular collapse. Coming to the respiratory system, uh, there is uh, Air embolism is always associated with sudden falling ETCO2. This is due to air in the pulmonary vasculature causes dead space ventilation, which causes a fall in ETCO2. In ABG, this is further uh, uh, recognized as hypo severe hypoxemia and hypercarbia. Uh, air embolism or emboli can also trigger the inflammatory cascade in the pulmonary vasculature. Uh, which attracts neutrophils and other inflammatory cells. Uh, the basement membrane permeability will be uh, lost, leading to uh, acute lung injury and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Coming to the central nervous system, uh, central nervous system is mostly associated with arterial embolism, which results in ischemic stroke. Uh, in this condition, there will be failure to wake the patient up from anesthesia. Um, in GI, which is uh, 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 in GI system, it is mostly associated with arterial embolism, uh, which presents with abdominal pain and bowel ischemia. Uh, next is monitoring of uh, 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 venous air embolism. It, in, uh, it includes uh, non-invasive and invasive monitoring. Non-invasive monitoring is ETCO2, uh, ET nitrogen level, precordial Doppler, 
transcranial Doppler and precordial stethoscope. ETCO2 is not, uh, uh, not, not most specific and sensitive for venous air embolism because it is also affected by perfusion pressure and respiratory pathology. Um, transcranial Doppler, in, uh, it involves an increased learning curve, so this is not the most sensitive and specific. And precordial stethoscope uh, is used only to hear the mill wheel murmur, to auscultate the mill, mill wheel murmur. The mill wheel murmur is always associated with a very large emboli. Among the uh, invasive monitors, it includes the transesophageal echo, esophageal Doppler, pulmonary artery catheter, and central venous pressure. Among these, uh, the transesophageal echo is has got an excellent sensitivity and uh, specificity. It also quantifies the size of the embolus. It is also gold standard for detection of uh, patent foramen ovale. It is difficult, but uh, it is difficult to differentiate the air from fat in case of transesophageal echo. And uh, the, uh, this uh, equipment is also expensive and it also carries a risk of esophageal injury. Coming to the clinical management, uh, we'll divide the clinical management into three parts, immediate resuscitation, prevention of further air entrainment, and efforts to remove or halt the progress of air already entrained. First, securing the uh, our, uh, important, uh, uh, first securing the airway with the uh, endotracheal tube, if already secured, uh, Increase the FiO2 to 100% oxygen. Switch off the nitrous oxide because the, as nitrous oxide is 35 times more soluble than nitrogen, it will diffuse into the air bubble and will further increase the size of the air embol emboli. So we have to switch off the nitrous oxide if, uh, if it's used. Maintain the ventilation. Our next aim will be to increase the venous pressure with IV fluids uh, using large uh, bore uh, IV cannulas uh, with vasopressors or inotropic uh, support. We have to lower the operative site below the level of the heart, stop any uh, procedure being done. Uh, we have to compress the major blood vessels directly or apply damp swabs up, uh, around the vasculature exposed. And uh, any pneumoperitoneum or any CO2 insufflation should be decompressed as soon as possible. Uh, efforts to remove would be by using a central venous catheter or, uh, or air aspiration catheter. Air aspiration catheter is usually a 16 gauge multi orifice catheter. This air is aspirated usually in Trendlenburg or left lateral decubitus position because theoretically it says air in the heart should flow towards the right atrium and away from the coronary ostia. Um, so that's it. Sir. We have prepared it from the anesthesia tutorial of the week. Yes, sir. From the test. It's yes. a very good article. It's also uh, just do the same thing for the visual fact so that you can uh, is visible on screen. Yes, sir. So any gas or this also is prepared from the same article only. So I just quickly go through. Any gas, not only air, you can get carbon dioxide embolism, you can get nitrous, uh, nitrogen embolism, and air embolism is also quite common. So, laparoscopic procedures, we can suddenly get a CO2 embolism also. And uh, it is the solubility and volume of gas which determines the circulate because small bubbles or small volume, say 5 ml or 10 ml, is not going to cause much problem. Not go and approve a major uh, venous gland and produce any problem. Whereas uh, air embolism that is uh, happening in a large volume is usually hydrogen. We have a, as you rightly mentioned, if we have an IV line, the bottle is empty and it has an open system. What is the difference between an open and closed system of IV infusion? We give everyday IV, isn't it? Yes, sir. 
What is the difference between a closed IV system and an open IV system? Nowadays, you are using these collapsible sachets or are you using the plastic bottles which are uh, for IV by? Uh, collapsible bags. Collapsible. Okay. Yes. Is yes. there any air vent in that? Uh, no, sir. No, isn't it? Yes. So that is called the closed IV system. Earlier, we were using bottles which needed an air vent to be introduced. Okay. That will enter in the air and then it will, once the bottle fluid gets empty, the air will start going into the vacuum. So to avoid that air, air pollution of application, nowadays we have made the sachets which help collapse and produce the pressure to drain all the fluid that is there inside. And once all the fluid has gone, there will not be any air because as you have noticed, the sachet will collapse and come to close to you. The two walls of the sachet will stick to each other. And you yes. just pull it out and throw it. And you are not supposed to have any air vent above the burette where the drop is uh, visualized. Okay? Earlier, I said, if you, know, if you have noticed, there will be an air vent above the dropper or the burette. Yes, yes. And that that yes. should not be there. If that is there, then it becomes an open system where air it can again come inside. So the two things that you have to make sure that to prevent an hydrogenic air embolism is it should be a collapsible sachet and the IV set that you are using should not have any air vent. Then it becomes what is called a closed IV system. And uh, there are three types of embolism, venous air embolism, arterial air embolism and paradoxical air embolism. So the venous air embolism, air getting into the venous circulation and the feeding the distal flow. Arterial air embolism that can happen even in smaller amount or smaller volumes of uh, air. So commonly it can a small volume of air in 5 ml can go into the coronary arteries and block the coronary and produce an acute uh, ischemic episode. Whereas for venous air embolism we require a larger volume. Okay? And paradoxically, it can transfer from the venous side to the system side, either because of the tendency defects like a foramen ovale, or from the pulmonary circulation into the left heart direction. Okay, so that is how it can transfer. And common factors for causing embolism, as you said, can be classified into surgical anesthetic and patient. And this uh, is also copied from the article. So the surgical conditions are sitting craniotomy, posterior post surgery, fine surgery, shoulder surgery, laparoscopic, even cesarean section where you exterminate the uterus or where a major venous channels are cut off, they can all produce venous air embolism. And uh, from the anesthetic point of view for venous air embolism, central venous axis is one of the most common danger that happens when you try to put a central vein or pressurized infusions, especially during hypovolemia and trauma, we use the pressure bag to infuse rapidly to the patient. And that can push the air also once the bottle becomes empty and you don't wash it, especially with the plastic bottles, you can push large amount of air. And uh, the endocrinic epidural vein cannulation from patient point of view, blunt trauma or hypovolemia, these things can produce a venous air embolism. And then the arterial embolism can happen mainly because during cardiopulmonary bypass, ECMO, cardiac ablation, intracardiacal, carotid endotracheny, caproscopic surgery, and intracardiacal radiology procedure. And the anesthetic factors producing arterial air embolism are error in training transducer set and the uh, use of heat during mechanical ventilation. And patient factors, if they have a patient from mobile or ASD, VSD, then it can, uh, air can travel from the venous side to the arterial side and produce an arterial air especially for the occlusion. <coughs> now, clinical manifestation depends on the volume. So normally, a volume of 5 ml per kg is considered large enough to cause a venous air embolism or a air lock in the right side of the heart. That is the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction can happen. 
So for a 70 kg person, you require at least 350 ml of air to go into the patient. And once the right ventricular outflow is blocked, no blood will flow into the pulmonary circulation. So no venous return will come to the, I mean, no arterialized blood will come to the left side, left atrium, left ventricle, and that will produce a catastrophic cardiovascular collapse. As air in small arterioles can be compensated by collateral supply. So we don't see arterial embolism as commonly as we see venous air embolism. And uh, but the structures like the heart, lungs, and brain are very sensitive, and there only sorry, yeah, even a small air can produce problem. So these are the three structures which are more sensitive: heart, lungs, and brain. Now, individual system-wise, what are all the effects? Cardiovascular system in an awake patient, patient may experience chest pain and palpitation, especially in the ward. If you don't uh, take care of the IV, you should say that the nurse forgets to change the bottle with an air vent and a lot of air goes in. And patient who is awake and experiencing this may complain of chest pain palpitation. They have both bradi as well as tachyarrhythmias, and there may be extreme changes in the ECG. Small volumes of air may lead to gradual elevation in pulmonary articulation. It may not be very dramatic. So it may gradually happen, whereas a large volume only produces a severe outflow tract obstruction, acute right side failure. And reduced RV flow will compromise to that particular uh, input, and that will also cause cardiovascular collapse. Whereas on the left side, small volumes of air entrained into coronary circulation can produce block in the LAD, as well as uh, it can lead to sudden ischemia and cardiac arrest. And there is a paradoxical air embolism occurring through the tighter coronal modulae. There may be symptoms of angina or an embolic stroke that's in the brain that can happen. Respiratory system effect in the anesthetic patient, there will be a sudden drop in entire CO2, and uh, there will be hypoxemia and hypercardia because of the reduced intake of oxygen. And uh, the air embolism can also trigger inflammatory response, producing a leakage in pulmonary edema, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema can happen. The awake patient, there will be sudden shortness of breath, then through the chest pain. Sometimes hemoptysis will occur, but it will be a very, very late sign. Coming to the CNS effect, Air embolism can produce ischemic stroke like features. Patient can develop peripheries or anesthesia. And after anesthesia, it may be one of the causes for the patient not to wake up immediately after general anesthesia. And there may be abnormal physiology response to light, which indicates there is a significant paradoxical embolism in a large ischemic response. The blood supply to the brain stem is affected by the air embolism, then it may produce cardiac dyspnea and apnea in the patient. Whereas in the awake patient, sudden onset of perfusion, dysarthria, hemiparinthia, and disease around the things can happen. Patient may deteriorate into coma as cerebral edema develops later on. Gas bubbles may rarely be observed in retinal vessels or fundoscopy. Very rarely you can see the gas bubbles. VA drug patient may have abdominal pain because of bowel ischemia. Skin changes. If the superficial vessels have the air embolism, then it may produce a crepitus. But surgical emphysema is not common with VNS embolism, but it may be a complication of laparoscopic procedure where extra vessation occurs apart from the gas entry into the venous system. Now, what are all the differential diagnosis of air embolism? Cardiovascular system, the air embolism can mimic mitotic ischemia, other causes of cardiogenic shock, hemorrhage or hypovolemia, arrhythmia, anomalies, and uh, anomalies of conduction and health. The respiratory system, pulmonary embolism, or embolism, other embolism like amniotic fluid embolism, and the pneumothorax, bronchospasm, pulmonary edema. Sentinel system, it may be a real hemorrhagic stroke, it may be secondary to drugs or hypoxemia, hypoglycemia, balances. And uh, immunologically, 
obstruction and flat is also can be made. So air embolism being a very rare condition, you must uh, make it as a last diagnosis unless it has happened dramatically. Then preventing air embolism, high risk procedures should be identified and should be discussed with the surgeon and be prepared to tackle it. And uh, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiogram is very useful to rule out and uh, which are the possibility of ear embolism is more if you consider putting in a sentence in a catheter or an asterisk in a catheter beforehand as a prophylactic measure. And uh, you must keep the volume status which is important because hypovolemia which we have to collapse, air can easily get sucked into that because of the mistakes. Yes. So, a free vascular. Free, mm. do not allow air to enter because it is already loaded with the blood. And the anti shock compression garments can be used to raise the systemic air pressure to prevent the air getting dragged into the body. And there are monitoring modalities available for venous air embolism, but there are no specific monitoring modalities to detect arterial air embolism. And the monitoring modality, we can classify them into non-invasive and invasive. Non-invasive can go by the physical signs uh, and what are all the advantages and disadvantages of each and everything. So you can take the EPCO2, entitled nitrogen level, precordial Doppler, transcranial Doppler, and precordial Doppler. These are all non-invasive, which can be put on the surface. Invasive transesophageal echocardiography, esophageal stethoscope, ulterior artery catheter, and CUT catheter. All these things are invasive procedures, which also will help you to identify the presence of And uh, uh, near infrared spectroscopy will mainly use for assessing the regional saturation in the brain. So it is more used in endosurgical procedures where the chances of embolism are more. And the clinical management, we rightly said, supportive treatment is the mainstay for both venous and arterial. And it can be subdivided into immediate resuscitation, prevention of further air entrainment, and efforts to remove or halt the progress of the air already entrained. Immediate resuscitation, always think of ABC, airway breathing circulation. And if the airway is not secured with an endotricate, better to insulate the patient and then be 100% oxygen. Increase the intravenous side pressure so that the further uh, uh, air entrainment will be prevented and also whatever is there will be not allowed to progress further. Flush by a large bore intravenous catheter and vasopressor ionotropic support to be given. If cardiac arrest has occurred, then you go for. Yes, ALS, the adverse life support protocol. And to prevent further air entrainment, lowering the operative size below the level of the heart by, or by stopping any process like uh, uh, the, the orthopedic surgery, bone training, and uh, ailing procedures carry the risk of not only fat and uh, fat embolism, but also carries the risk of air embolism. So directly compressing major vessels, temporarily application of bone cement, flooding the operative site with irrigating fluid or saline, damp swabs to be put over there. Especially this is useful in uh, head and neck surgery and uh, post view training for the surgery. This is what they do. They irrigate the operative site with fluid so that instead of air, only the fluid will get stuck. And uh, damp swabs can be applied to prevent the air going into the vessel. And uh, during laparoscopy, if you suspect uh, embolism, immediately decompress. Go to the abdomen, pressurize, and entrance of site will be discontinued because it will expand the amount of air that is gone. And the third step to remove the air that is already gone in is by aspiration. So, this is uh, the common Durant uh, maneuver where you put the patient in the left lateral with a head down tilt. And try to aspirate it from the right way. The air embolism syndrome is a condition. After the air embolism, uh, air has been sucked in, it may produce an inflammatory response because it is a foreign matter. And that will lead to inflammation and organ destruction. 
and that promotes platelet aggregation, produces system inflammation, DEC like to care or multi organ disorder. So these are all the points that you have to remember to write for this particular question. Yes, of course, you can easily finish off with this piece of minutes and the video. And all the points are covered. So, first 